Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on remote learning and engagement, best practices and opportunities in Jewish education and day schools. This is the final session in a three-part series on remote learning and engagement. Since March, 2020, there have been very few educational interventions and initiatives that have not had to pivot to the virtual delivery of services and programs. While some institutions have expanded already existing capacities, others have had to radically reimagine their educational practices and business models. In some cases, this has uncovered ways of reaching never previously imagined audiences. In this session on Jewish education, we explore how day schools have been easily, um, sorry, have been especially nimble in adapting to the provisions of schooling from home. And we share findings from an international study on how students have experienced this change. Today, we are fortunate to hear from Rachel a Abrahams, uh, Senior Advisor for Education, Grants and Programs at Mayberg Foundation, Mark Wolf, Vice President, Program Strategy and Impact Prisma Center for Jewish Day Schools, and Alex Pumson, Principal and Managing Director of Rasa Consulting. And I also want to thank Alex. He's been a partner of mine throughout all of these three programs. So thank you, thank you, especially Alex, for helping me put together all of these wonderful um, webinars these last few weeks. And now I am happy to hand it over to Mark Wolf, who will start us off today. Thank you. Thank you, Tamar, and thanks to the Jewish Funders Network uh, for organizing the webinar and for Alex and for inviting uh, me and Rachel into it. Uh, I'm really grateful for the active and ongoing partnerships that we have with JEIC and the Mayberg Foundation and Alex and Rossoff Consulting, uh, and many thanks to the Jim Joseph Foundation for funding the research that uh, we're going to be diving into a little bit today. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Prisma is the network of Jewish, for Jewish day schools in North America. We were founded in 2016 as a resultant merger of five organizations that had previously served day schools and yeshivas across the denominational spectrum. Our professionals are diverse in the field, uh, and uh, it's really wonderful to be uh, in conversation with everybody today. So from our work with 300 day schools and yeshivas across North America, we have a unique perspective at Prisma of the field. And to start us off today, I'd love to offer a brief perspective on the issues and choices and to sort of review some of the history uh, that uh, the pandemic since the beginning in, in North America, and particularly as it relates to remote learning and engagement. Now about a year into the pandemic, we can look back and I identify a number of distinct eras of the pandemic so far. And I classify them with the highly, uh, you know, scientific term of if we could only get to eras, uh, and each has its own challenges and response. If we could only get to Pesach, that was the first era, knowing that a lot of schools went digital right around the time of Purim, which we're about to celebrate. The pandemic started impacting Jewish day schools a year ago, and schools immediately responded with going online, really within a matter of a few days. Schools were up and running on technology platforms and were in ongoing communications with students, with faculties, with families, and, uh, and their ongoing plans and how they were shifting every day. It was a real field-wide response. And from Prisma, we were watching, we were collecting, we were gathering school leaders so that they could learn from one another and benefit from uh, different expertise that, that different schools had. I really think that was driven by sort of two strengths of, of Jewish day schools. The first is a constant drive towards innovation. Schools had already been engaged with educational technology on many different levels. And when we brought them together, they were able to learn from and with each other on how to create the best model to continue teaching and learning even in a fully online environment. Second is clearly access to resources. Not only financial resources to enable to be able to give access to devices uh, and to create the technology platforms that enable teaching and learning to continue, but also personnel. You had teachers who were more than willing to throw themselves into a completely new different model of teaching in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, that has contributed so much to a number of things, including advancing the value proposition of Jewish day schools across North America at this point, which has really also in, contributed to an uptick in enrollment that we have seen uh, because of the pandemic response of Jewish day schools. Our response in all of this has again been collecting uh, field leaders, gathering them, creating resources, doing data and research, research, uh, partnering with JESC and the Mayberg Foundation and Rossoff Consulting to both provide resources, do ongoing training, and to understand what's going on in the field so we could support school leaders in making the decisions that they were having to make on a daily basis. The next era I'll call, if we can only get to summer. How are the schools gonna get to the end of the year? in online learning. 
but also at this point, they started thinking about how are we going to create community? How are we going to keep our relationship with the state of Israel? How are we going to engage our families and our, and our broader communities? They started by going fully on with Zoom. You saw schools that basically recreated their school day on Zoom or another online platform. And you know what? It took its toll. Students were tired, teachers were tired, administrators were tired, and they realized very quickly at that point, you know what? We need to shift here a little bit. And so they focused on a few other things. They included more educational technology tools to mix up the way that teaching and learning was happening in the classrooms. And they started looking into things like creative assessments because they were all thinking, how are we gonna give our students a test when they're sitting at home in their living room or in their bedroom? Uh, so creative assessment became a massive category of conversation amongst Jewish day school leaders. So that was if we can only get to summer. And they did it. They did creative engagement, engaging opportunities uh, with the state of Israel for Yom HaAtzma'ut, Yom HaZikaron, Yom HaShoah. Uh, schools really created a greater sense of community amongst their families, serving often as a center of knowledge for their families, including access to uh, uh, health experts and, and uh, public officials so that they could present to their schools their their response to the pandemic and how they were going to create trust and engagement with their families so that the families would, would, would continue keeping their students in school. The next era I'll call, if we could only get to the return to school in late summer or fall. So as we see that the pandemic response is building in schools, first starting with only online learning, then thinking, thinking about more community engagement, uh, other ritual uh, engagement with the state of Israel. Then we got to, if we could only return to school in the late summer or fall. And here, a couple of new items came onto the agenda. First, mental health and wellness of students, of teachers, of administrators, of parents. It became a serious concern. We at Prisma ran a training over the course of the summer to help schools prepare for training their faculty on to be more aware of social emotional issues, even when they're engaging online through Zoom. The training of teachers. We partnered with uh, United Better Lesson, JEIC and the Mayberg Foundation to train over 300 teachers over the course of the summer in online pedagogies. We knew what they were returning to and they had the experience from the first few months of the pandemic and they knew that they needed to be shifting the way that they were teaching in the classroom so that they could be engaging their students differently. Uh, and finally, developing systems. How are they gonna go back to school in any way, shape or form safely? Be that fully online or trying to do it fully in person. They developed pods, social distancing, renovations, HVAC systems were updated in schools to create the kind of environment that uh, where students and teachers could return. They returned and a lot of people were really kind of blown away by it. For those of you who have school-aged children, I'm sure that you were blown away by it as well. I bet there was some kind of a betting pool in Las Vegas for how long this was gonna last. Uh, I would have lost at that point. I'll just tell you right there personally. Uh, then we got to, if we could only get to Sukkot. Uh, nobody thought we were gonna get through the high holidays. Nobody thought we were gonna get through Rosh Hashanah, but then it became, if we could only get through Sukkot. And we were balancing so many different models of school. We're in the early phase of the pandemic. We were looking at uh, primarily online learning. Now we were balancing different models of schooling in-person learning, the schools that were trying to do socially distant mass education in, in their classrooms, online learning, schools that had not returned to the classroom and were still thinking about the creative ways that they could shift how they were doing the teaching. Hybrid, schools with students that had some days in and some days out, and what we are now calling concurrent learning, where you have a teacher in a classroom with a bunch of students surrounding them and a number of students who are on a screen be behind them in front of them someplace on Zoom and really challenging teachers to be engaging students who were both in front of them, masked and socially distant and online at the same time. It's an educational model that nobody has ever encountered before. Then if we could only get to Thanksgiving, that was starting to manage pods in the quarantine. And that what's really drove us in our relationship with JESC and the Mayberg Foundation to launch Pedagogies of Online Learning, which is a training that we're doing right now to increase the capacity of schools to support the different kind of learning modalities and particularly concurrent learning uh, and to offer their own internal uh, uh, professional development. So that's 
sort of an overview. We, and we've gotten through now, the latest era was sort of, if we could only get to winter break uh, and the schools that have had the winter breaks either in December or in early January or earlier in January or now in, into February, that's been the next model. And they're balancing, how do we keep students engaged? How do we train our teachers well enough so that they can continue uh, really deepening uh, teaching and learning in the classroom? So how are schools su successful? I'll give two examples. One, starting with values. If we know what a school believes in values, then we're not surprised when the pandemic response aligns with that. And the second, good pedagogy during the pandemic is not that different from great teaching and learning at any time during the course of the year. We're just using some different tools. So starting with values, if we know that schools are saying that ex, uh, educational equity or differentiated instruction is a, is a core value or student-centered instruction is a core value, then it's gonna animate what they think about classroom setup for concurrent learning when you have students learning online and in classrooms at the same time. It's gonna help inform decisions around technology, pedagogy, professional development, student support. When we're starting with those kind of values and saying this is the kind of environment that we're trying to create for our students, that's gonna really define how, how schools are responding. Educators know that good pedagogy during a pandemic is not different than great teaching and learning at any time. I just said it, I'll say it again, and it really is what animates and drives our work in a lot of this. We want to build nurturing communities of learners. We want to provide strategies to assess progress towards goals. We want to engage students in dynamic learning and really support teachers in being the best educators that they possibly can. Our investment in teaching and learning an investment in educational technology at this point is an investment in good in good pedagogy in general. That's what we see as the future. For those who uh, have been in conversations with me in the past, you'll know that I, I am want to quote Churchill at this point in saying that we should never waste a good crisis. This is a moment that we could really accelerate our adaptation and adoption of, of good educational technology. And we've done the work to really study about what the impact of that is. And this was early on in the pandemic, uh, Alex and Rossoff Consulting did some great work with the support of the Jim Joseph Foundation to dive into what has been the student experience with this. And they surfaced a lot of excellent uh, data on this. And I'd love to pass it off to Alex now, who's gonna give us a window into those first sort of two phases of the pandemic. If we could only get to Pesach and if we could only get to the end of the year and what the, the online engagement and learning was with students. Alex. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Thank you indeed. And thank you to Tamar for the support in enabling this conversation uh, to take place. Uh, as Mark said, uh, I'm gonna take you back to the summer, to the second era Mark identified, if only we can make it to the summer. And I'm gonna share with you data from uh, two studies, uh, one that was conducted in Europe and Latin America and one that was conducted in the United States or North America, I should say, with Jewish high schools, Jewish day high schools in North America. And uh, hopefully it will shed some light on students' experience of the extraordinary efforts to which their schools went during those first, let's say six months uh, of, of the pandemic. So let me just share my screen and we'll get underway here. Okay. Um, so we're focusing on remote schooling. The bottom line here is what you can't see from here, you can see from there. Uh, that's somewhat cryptic right now, but hopefully it will make sense uh, as we go further into the presentation. So I'm sharing data from two data sets. One that was initially gathered with the support of the government of Israel, the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs, as part of their United Initiative. That's an initiative that serves Jewish day schools in France, historic communities in Europe and in Latin America. And in those communities, the, the pandemic really uh, wrecked its damage somewhat earlier than in North America. And at that time, really around Pesach time, uh, the, the ministry asked us to try and take a snapshot or gain a picture of what those communities were experiencing. Communities like Milan and Rome that were particularly badly hit in the early months of the pandemic. So we're gonna be looking at some data that comes from those communities. Uh, you can see there uh, almost 800 responses from students in six schools in uh, Europe and Latin America. And then a study that was supported with 
uh, was supported by the Jim Joseph Foundation and conducted in partnership with Prisma at a point when we already had the data in hand from other places and were intensely curious to see what would we learn by comparison from data gathered uh, in North America and perhaps more importantly in what way might we be able to serve schools by enabling them to get a picture of their students and their students experience over the previous um, uh, four or five months. This study, the study in North America, was focused exclusively on high schools. And the data I'm going to share initially comes from the North American studies, particularly interested to learn what the students, what the students perceive to have been the impact of remote schooling on their overall educational competitiveness, their educational uh, development. So a key question in the survey was uh, to ask the students whether they felt that remote learning had set back their education in some way. And I think as you see here, I think that something quite maybe surprising, maybe even remarkable, is that 60% of the students felt um, that their learning had only been set back in a small fashion. There's 19% uh, of them who didn't think it had been set back at all, and we'll talk a little bit more about those folks. And even those who say a little, from our perspective, once we dug into um, the kind of language or, or students' elaboration, when we asked them to explain in the survey uh, why they chose a particular response, it was clear that those who said a little um, were basically just highlighting small hiccups rather than major setbacks. For example, a student who wrote explaining his choice, his or her choice, I found that I continue to understand concepts and I feel comfortable with the top topics we studied while online. However, I feel like I missed out on a group and hands-on activities that would have been done in class. Now, that's not a negative assessment of the experience. It's a recognition that this, this experience is more limited than what might be the case if the student remained in school. But the overall assessment is a positive assessment of uh, what, what took place there. Um, I'll give you another example, another student. I think that in that in-person learning is far more valuable than remote learning. While I did complete my class's curriculum, I think that I would have had a better understanding of the concepts if I learned in a normal setting. Because there isn't a sense here that the wheels have fallen off. On the contrary, there's kind of a, an appreciation that uh, learning has gone on, but it may not just be quite the same as it would otherwise have been. So let's try and understand what may be, uh, what may be some of the factors at work here when students respond in this way. I think the first thing to highlight is students' appreciation of the efforts made by their school. Um, when, we, when, we, when you look at the responses of those students who say that their education was severely impacted, only a very small proportion of those students, fewer than 5%, kind of blamed their school in some way. They believed that if their learning was set back, there were other factors at work. So they, so they very much appreciated what the schools were providing for them. And they were particularly aware of what their Jewish day schools were providing by way of comparison to their peers in, uh, especially their peers in the public sector. So to, to, to read to you a few examples of some of the things students noted in the survey, I have no complaints about what the school has been doing. I just can't learn as well online and I learn better in person. Not the school's fault if I have been set back in some way. I like the extra time I have to complete assignments and less pressure when doing schoolwork. I enjoy working and learning on my own more. Actually a positive experience for this particular student. And I think my favorite quote from this study, it just felt like school came to my house. I still had the same assignment tests and quizzes, so there was nothing I could complain about. The same things were taught. I could even argue that it boosted my education because many schools around me were shut down while I was fortunate enough to have class and learn. The word got out pretty quickly how Jewish day schools were doing by way of comparison to other schools and students were especially uh, grateful for that. So how do we explain the ways in which some felt they were set back or the extent to which some felt they were set back and others felt that they were not so badly set back? 
so much of this seems to come down to mindset, the mindset of the student, the ways in which they were responding to what was obviously a challenging situation. So here's an example of positive mindset. It was a challenging change. However, I feel that things like this can only help. It gives us a different view of how we can improvise with our education abilities. We heard those kinds of things um, from a number of students, just to give you a flavor of another one. I feel that remote learning has given me an opportunity to find myself and discover what kind of person I want to be. I mean, th these feels like incredibly adult responses to a challenge and seeing such challenges as an opportunity to grow. Now, evidently, not every young person is able to approach the world in such a fashion. But what was striking to us when we looked at students' um, open-ended responses, the way they talked about their experiences, it was clear how consistent their mindset was or the mindset conveyed in those open-ended responses with their responses to other items in the survey. So those who felt that their education had been most set back viewed almost every dimension of the experience in negative terms. So they would report that they had there was more friction with their siblings at home over technology, or they were disappointed with the resources the school was employing. They felt shortchanged by having less contact time with teachers than they would otherwise have. And they noted having covered less ground than their older siblings had done in the same grade in the same school. If you came at this situation with a negative mindset, it, many elements in this situation looked difficult. There's no question about it. So I think a large part of, of, of how we interpret the ways in which students were responding is very much about the psychology of the individual, about the mindset with which they came to the situation. And certainly kind of, I think that touches on something that Mark raised that as, as the pandemic went on, the degree to which schools have become more alert to the, the need to engage with those social emotional needs of students. I think that's number one. A second, a second finding for us in terms of understanding um, why some responded positively and why others responded less positively, I think somewhat took us by surprise. And it comes down to a relationship between the ways in which students responded to this particular question and how they responded to another question uh, we, answer, we asked. This, this other question asked the students um, to what extent well, we asked them to what extent was their connection to various uh, individuals or groups strengthened during the course of the pandemic? It may have been to family members, it may have been to their broader community, and specifically there was a question there about to what extent has the pandemic strengthened your or, or your experience during the pandemic resulted in a strengthening of your connection to your uh, school community? And what was particularly striking here was the degree of correlation between those students who said their uh, education had not been at all set back or only set back a little, and those who responded that their connection to small school community was somewhat or very much connected. And digging into those survey responses, uh, digging in particularly to the open-ended responses, we got the picture that the relationship here, the, the causal relationship runs from a feeling of school community to a feeling of educational success. Is that the more that students felt a connection with their school community, the more likely they were to feel that they had coped well and they were thriving in, uh, in these very challenging circumstances. Now, in order to understand this better, we uh, interviewed heads of school uh, whose students had responded particularly positively to, uh, to the survey and, and had felt that they had done pretty well. And there were some common elements or common characteristics, I should say, to those schools whose students had done, who, had, who felt positive. First of all, a number of those schools were, uh, came from smaller, tight-knit communities outside the, the, the bigger cities of uh, North America. So there was already a kind of heightened sense of community uh, in those places. Secondly, what we learned from uh, educators in these schools was the extent to which they invested in 
uh, community building experiences for their students, whether that may have been through daily prayer, town hall meetings for their students, and ex extracurricular events remotely or at distance, such as shelter in place, color war, yama utspa, yama utspa parades that visited every child's home. Like the schools whose students felt a strong sense of community at, and the same schools whose students felt they were thriving had invested in an effort to cultivate community. And while that investment may have seen like a distraction from academics, I think an extremely important finding here is the extent to which this wasn't a zero sum game, is that it felt really felt like a case of the more the more. Now, I think our, our argument around that is strengthened further by reference to this image. Uh, we didn't gather data from Yosemite National Park, but the images here show you two ways of thinking about uh, a particular uh, point in the distance. We can look at it close up, and essentially that's what we've been doing until now with our uh, data from our North American schools. Or we can use a wide angle lens. We can look at those schools in comparison to other schools. And an unusual opportunity presented by the pandemic, there have been some very terrible things about the pandemic, but a, a positive for those of us in the research business is that it has given us an opportunity to gather data comparative data from Jewish day school students, both from North America and other places in the world. And um, by using a wide angle lens, we get a chance to compare the experiences of students, whether in Budapest, Buenos Aires, and the Bay Area. And, and, and that comparison is instructive. So when we look at that question about to what extent uh, did remote learning strengthen your connection to, what we see here is the pink responses are Latin America, the green are Europe, and the purple are North America, is that overall, when looking at those who responded somewhat or very much to these questions, to what extent did remote learning strengthen your connection to, those students in uh, Latin America and Europe were significantly more likely to respond somewhat or very much to the notion that their connection to their local Jewish community had been strengthened and their connection to their, their school community had been strengthened. There was no difference across the communities, incredibly similar, when it came to uh, their connection to other family members. I want to dig into some of those responses uh, in a moment and try and understand what we might learn from them. A another question we asked the students in all three countries or in all three locations, to what extent has online learning contributed to you contributed to you having fun with friends and feeling that you're not alone. Again, the Latin Americans, actually, basically the schools were in Buenos Aires are off the charts here. They're having a lot of fun with their friends during the pandemic. And then when it comes to feeling that you're not alone, the Europeans indicate that this experience has, has really uh, cultivated that. So in the same way that we went to interview those folks in North America, whose schools had performed above the average, we talked to those uh, school leaders in uh, Argentina and in, in Milan, Budapest and Rome about what was going on uh, in, in their schools. And what we learned, I think, is really instructive when it comes to an insight about the contribution of community to Jewish education is that uh, schools in Buenos Aires have a deep commitment to cultivating community in ways that perhaps are not replicated in uh, most schools in North America. For example, one quick example is that those schools uh, uh, hire a, a so-called machanech, an educator who has exclusively pastoral roles for each, for every 50 or 100 students to build community among those students. At a time of crisis in a pandemic, they saw the benefits of investing in that kind of intensive cultivation of pastoral outcomes, right? When it came to Europe, what we learned about uh, in Europe again is, is how in certain places, schools really function as community hubs, like community is built in. So like in Milan and Rome, the, 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 the synagogues are very much um, distinguished by the ethnic Jewish background of their members. 
the one place where where everybody every child everybody's children can come together is the Jewish day school that's where community is found in those communities and then lastly is like um and and this is not this was beyond anybody's control is that uh, in some of those European cities Madrid was a good example Milan another one was um that in many of those places Jewish families lived in apartments many of them without without balconies and, it, and, and to a large degree the only place their children in a sense could breathe air was in school or through school remotely connecting with their with, with their friends and their peers online so kind of trying to tie a number of points together here it it, it feels very much that the the pandemic gave us an opportunity to 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 observe the extent to which doubling down on community far from being um, a distraction and a, an alternative uh, from the primary business of schooling can in many ways be a, a very firm foundation and a, a powerful resource in intensifying students academic and educational experiences. Okay, thank you. I am now going to hand over to Rachel. Thanks, Alex. Okay, so um, I'm going to speak about a little bit almost as a respondent to the data uh, from a foundation funder perspective. First, just to give you a bit of background on the Mayberg Foundation. The Mayberg Foundation's mission is to proliferate Jewish wisdom and values in the contemporary world. We do this through grant making, but also through support of our operating centers, including the Jewish Education Innovation Challenge, which Mark mentioned. We've been privileged to partner with Prisma a few times over the course of the last year. JAIC catalyzes radical change in day schools, so it constantly is exploring new methods of instruction and pedagogy in Jewish education. And ultimately, JIC seeks to provide more meaningful learning experiences for students that optimize their internalization of Jewish wisdom, identity, and decision-making. So of course, uh, at the foundation and at JIC, we have been following the experience over the last year uh, with remote learning and now with concurrent learning with interest to learn both what the successes and challenges have been. And uh, the Rasa Prisma survey was really an opportunity to look to our learners, the students, and focus on what really matters to them, what they uh, have experienced, and uh, to think about what skills, mindsets, and dispositions we want to ensure as we as educators move forward uh, from this experience and in the next uh, stage. I don't know, Mark. What will that? If that, what, what will that be? <laughs> what post-pandemic? Uh, the, the post-pandemic question. Uh, so we're thankful, of course, to our colleagues at the Jim Joseph Foundation who supported this research that we can all learn from, not just during COVID times, but for afterwards as well. And um, I just wanted to quote George Kuros, who's the author of the Innovator's Mindset says that the best way to help our kids navigate this process, both the negatives and the positives, is to be on the journey with them and to speak from a place of experience and to listen and learn from a place of curiosity. And I think so we, we very much appreciated the opportunity to get to hear from students in a aggregated data kind of way. That's something that we don't often get to experience when we are looking at large scale information. Very often we're talking to the school heads, the teachers, etc. And very often we forget about student voices. So this survey was really a very important piece of information for us. And, and additionally, we believe that the introduction of data can be the beginning of a conversation about what is working, what is not working, and also what is now possible for learning and for learners that we couldn't imagine before. So as we continue to learn, uh, JIC wants to explore and consider what will school, schools choose as the new normal uh, coming out of this experience. And in particular, we are thinking about um, questions that we need to ask when schools begin to use technology. So some of those questions include, uh, is the way that we're using technology building connections? or severing them, certainly something that the survey uh, looked at. Is this fostering deep learning as well as critical thought and creation, or is the technology actually doing the opposite and promoting just kind of surface level 
thinking. And lastly, through our learning with technology, are we modeling the balance and human connection that we want so that we can effectively guide our students to achieve that same balance? What we found is that technology accelerates everything. Both good practices and bad practices. We've certainly seen that over the course of the last year. And we know that we need to be striving really for two things. One is continued deep learning, that's crucial, uh, but also that human relationships are really what guarantee that schools will be relevant for the long term. And, um, and that certainly, again, came through in the data that that community and the connection to community was extremely important. So uh, of particular interest to us at JIC were actually the recommendations from the report, which Alex didn't focus on, so I will. Uh, they, the first recommendation was, and I'm quoting, less is more, spend fewer hours in direct contact with students, give them more time to breathe, give them a chance to get on top of the work, get off the screen, more, be more independent of the teacher and more dependent on one another. And even when students do have contact time, meaning the face-to-face -face with the teacher, create space during that time for students to share their experiences with one another. And that teachers should consider not just using that time for direct instruction. So that even during class time, less is actually more. And that's something that uh, Mark kind of referenced. We've been thinking about ways to support teachers in thinking about uh, different pedagogies that really follow these recommendations, uh, both in terms of how to use that time on Zoom so that we experience less Zoom fatigue than might have been happening at the early stages of the pandemic, and also to thinking about how do we actually get students off screen. And so we believe that one perfect way to implement this recommendation is to consider asynchronous learning. And um, in particular, the the asynchronous learning platforms and courses that exist, both in general studies, but we have a particular interest in Judaics. Um, and these provide really a way for students to pace themselves and learn independently. And they balance very nicely with face-to-face, -face, even if that face-to-face -face is remote instruction. And really, um, that's what blended learning is really about, the balance between the two. And that seems to dovetail with the report's recommendations. So at the time that the report came out, uh, JIC was actually supporting a project for schools to consider using asynchronous courses for Jewish studies as this academic year launched. And we actually utilized the report data in some of our social media posts to help us advertise the opportunity. So it really shows how data for the field can be important to us as consumers in, in different ways. And we were happy to be able to, uh, to incorporate it and to use it. Um, lastly, another area of interest for JIC is the affective part of education, how we shape our students' attitudes and beliefs. And while this was not directly addressed in the data, it's clear that students who felt connected to their schools through community building activities felt more positively about their educational experience. And we view that really as a lesson for all times, not just during COVID, that relationship building and experiential learning are crucial components of day school education. And when they are done well, we believe that they affect students' views of their educational accomplishments, which hopefully puts them on the road to be continued engaged learners and engaged Jews, which is really one of the goals of both the foundation and JAIC. And so as we at JIC and the foundation turn to the rest of this school year and begin even to look towards the next school year, the report's call for more focus on personalized learning looms large in our thoughts. We're thinking a lot about how schools can serve the range of experiences, both academic and emotional, that our students have had for the past 12 months. Uh, so a lot of schools have begun to focus on social emotional learning alongside academic learning. We're thinking about how we can help our educators be prepared to meet that challenge of reaching a range of students with a range of experiences. And I think we're also thinking about what else do we need to learn uh, past the data that Rasov presented from August 2020 about what our students are saying about this past year's experience and how that will 
help us prepare as we move forward. And I think we'd love to hear via the chat um, what other people are thinking about as we begin to look towards spring and, and next year, and also what things you might be interested in learning as well. So thank you. I, I'm going to jump in uh, while, while the, hopefully the, the chat uh, flow builds up and, and ask the two of you a, a, a question because, you know, in many ways, and often this is the case with research, there's a time lag between kind of sharing it in a venue like this and, and when the data was gathered. And I'm kind of curious about uh, what you think might be different today, you know, six months on from the second era that Mark identified to, I don't know if we're in the fourth, fifth or sixth, but whichever one it is, is how do you think students are experiencing this today compared to, to back then? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll address it from two perspectives, sort of what we're seeing from the field and also my focus group of four, uh, which <laughs> is uh, my, my junior in high school, my freshman in high school, my sixth grader and my wife who teaches high school uh, to get the perspective that they've been having on, on the multiple days that they've either uh, today, they actually all happen to be in school, uh, but uh, they've sort of moved between uh, uh, quarantining and, and being online. But what I've seen is that their experience and the and their their day to day experience has shifted almost every single week as the things have been unfolding. I'm seeing greater use of of creative technology from teachers uh, looking to be engaging students differently. Uh, you know, I'll echo uh, both the finding what and what Rachel said in terms of the spending less time in direct face to face instruction when when they're online. Um, and a lot more of smaller group work or independent work, uh, teachers giving, teachers coming on, bringing the classroom together for a sense of community, and then giving instruction and sending them on their way, often leaving them on the screen so that they can interact with each other. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot more creative engagement online with students for those, for those, for that time that they are online. Uh, I would hope that we would see a number of the, the engagement numbers sort of ticking up for the students uh, based on the experimentation that we have seen across the field, not only in my wife and my own kids, but across the field uh, where we've seen schools really trying to think creatively about how they are uh, teaching students and how they're engaging them even more deeply than just the content that they're learning, but also the sense of community, the clubs that have that have come back and that are now meeting online, a lot of them, uh, the, you know, ritual observance in schools and how they're doing it creatively. Um, there's been a lot more focus on not only just the classroom instruction time, but the greater experience of the school and how it looks different uh, as the year has unfolded. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll just add, I think one of the differences between the group you looked at, Alex, and what it would look like now is that to some extent in August, students had a uniform experience, right? They, we were all online, right? Schools were closed. And now, even within one school, students are having different experiences because they've either, some parents have chosen to keep their children at home, understandably. Some students have been in quarantine for different periods of the year. Uh, some schools are working on a hybrid model where they're only in school some days and, and others. So it, I would imagine the data is more all over the place, right? And that the, the reactions of students are different based on what they're experience has been. I mean, one of the reasons that JIC and Prisma decided to work on this issue of concurrent learning, right, is that we understood, I think, both a challenge for teachers, but also what it meant to be the child that was at home, right, kind of watching the class in school happen and thinking about how to think about equity, right, for those students across mm -hmm. the board and how all students could have at least to some extent, as similar an experience as possible. So I would imagine that's really like a big change. And again, I think as, as we think about next stages, right, of schooling, what will it mean to hopefully reincorporate everyone back into a more uniform experience, you know, once again? I think that's, that's kind of the next stage that I see coming down the pike. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, it, it's a challenge, right? If kids haven't been in school for a whole year and then they're coming back, what does that look like? Um, you know, different things like that. Right. And I would just add to that. And what can we learn from the so many creative models that schools are deploying right now? 
uh, you know, there's one small school that we work closely with that has split their day in, in half. And in the morning, they have been online the entire year. And in the morning, they do online instruction with the class. And in the afternoon, because of their school size, they're able to do personalized instruction of their students. And so the teachers are spending time one-on-one -on -one with the students in their classes over the course of the afternoon. Uh, and that's really enabling them to, I mean, talk about personalized learning. That is about as personalized learning as you could possibly get with one-on-one -on -one instruction with a, with, a, with a teacher. And they're thinking right now, when we return from all of this, what does that look like when we're back in the classroom? And is it a model that they, that they can experiment with, uh, not only online, but also in person? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, Mark, that reminds me of, I think one of the most compelling examples we found of, you know, in, in, in our interviews with the head of school about why their students' data's data were, were so positive was the head, the head of school said, well, at some point we realized we shouldn't be trying to do this for five days a week. We should be scaling back to Zoom-based instruction four days a week and then use Friday for office hours, right? And office hours would be optional. In other words, if a student felt they needed assistance, they needed help, then they would make, a, make time with whoever. And if they didn't, we would trust them to continue working themselves or simply use the time appropriately to kind of uh, decompress from having been online for the full week. And kind of thinking about, well, you know, so what are the, what's the implications of that for uh, the post-pandemic world? Like how comfortable would parents be with a four day a week model, optional fifth day a week model would they, would they still be ready to pay the same fees? I, I mean, it, it's an in, you know, interesting to imagine like what might be the takeaways or, or does something like, is something like that a, a case of crisis management? And, and uh, it, it would it'd be exceptional, you know, when, when, when the return occurs, the return will be a return to what was, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I'm not sure if, I'm, if we're going to see any schools who are going to try that kind of a model of sort of being in it and, and embracing a Zoom day. Uh, my, my sense is that the Zoom day is something that people are looking forward to get rid of. But what I am interested in seeing is the schools that have said, all right, however many periods of history we have, however, however, however many periods of Talmud we have during the week, that they've scaled back over the course of the pandemic to create more space in the lives of students and to really understand that we've been pushing kids really hard in school. Uh, you know, Jewish day schools are rigorous and they spend a lot of time, you know, if you have before the pandemic from eight until five o'clock, you know, they're spending more time than a lot of, you know, people in America spend at work. Uh, and I think that this has been an experience to sort of scale back a little bit. And right now the conversation that we're seeing happen in a lot of schools is what of this can we keep? Should we make the day a little bit shorter? Should we try to pack a little bit less in? Are we really sacrificing so much content to, to try to create a little bit more space in the lives of our students so that they can uh, manage it uh, uh, from a mental health standpoint a little bit more? And the role of social and emotional learning in the classroom on an ongoing basis, and not just done by school counselors, but really embraced holistically by, by a school. Yeah, so I'll say I'm particularly interested in where have teachers kind of let go <laughs> not so much from a coverage perspective, but like where they've given students more choice, where they've given students more independence, and will those pieces, how has that worked, both for the students and for the teachers, and, um, and, and what do they think about that moving forward, right? I think that, that we might hear different things from teachers and from students regarding that kind of model. Um, but, but I actually, Alex, I think what I kind of have witnessed is a little bit about uh, even, even as schools opened this year, while there was a lot of creativity, there was also a desire for return to normalcy, whatever that meant, right? And so I think we might continue to see some of that tension between what did we learn that was good, right? And, and what the, did normalcy look like? Um, you know, so I'm, I'm curious kind of where that will end up. And I, I must admit, you know, Mark would have lost the bet about uh, how long schools would stay open. I would have lost the bet about kind of 
schools needing more online learning than they did, right? Meaning I thought that be, when once we came back, even because people had seen some of the things that happened in the spring, that we would have seen more of asynchronous learning this past year. And um, and I I we did I don't think we saw as much as I thought was going to happen. So I'm curious, kind of how that will play out as we move forward. I think some of that is about kind of you're in crisis mode, and it's hard to, to do too yeah. much that's new. But if you are post pandemic and you can do some reflection on kind of what worked and didn't work, then what does that allow in terms of innovation as we yeah. as we move forward? So yeah. that, that's something I'm thinking about. I, and I just I want to raise maybe a different issue. One of the things that the study really didn't look at in, in terms of student um, reflection that I'm very curious about myself and obviously at JIC is kind of what has the year meant for students' attitudes towards the Jewish piece of schooling? You know, Mark referenced kind of the parts that's not about class, right? So some schools didn't have tefillah the same way, right? What did that mean for students' experience and thinking about prayer? What did it mean for their thinking about God, right? In the context of what happened this past year. Um, and, and what did it mean in terms of observance and things like that they're used to doing in school that they weren't able to do? Or in some situations, was it heightened because there was now a Kabbalah Shabbat for the whole community, or there was now a Havdalah for the whole community, right? That never happened before. So I think that's, to me, also an area that I'm curious to learn more about and see what the impact has been in terms of students' attitudes and beliefs uh, from a Jewish perspective. Well, as you know, we're always happy to do more studies. So <laughs> thinking, about, uh, thinking around those kinds of issues, I just want to respond to a question that came through in the Q&A because somebody was asking there, um, wondering why the levels of community feeling seem higher in Europe uh, and Latin America. Are schools in the US more focused on academic achievement or American, American students and families more focused on academic success for access to higher education? And I think, you know, uh, I think there are a couple of factors, to, to answer that question, I think there are a couple of factors at work here, like, uh, and, and I think the price of day school education plays into this, is that I think schools feel, if, if parents are paying those big bucks, we need to be providing full service that is going to do the best possible job of enabling their children to move on to the next level, whatever it is. And that, that may introduce a kind of more kind of transactional relationship. Again, even, even with the best of intentions, it's like, it, this is about providing service. And, and as Mark indicated, it's like, it, it resulted in a kind of packing in more, packing in more kind of philosophy is that if, if parents want this, we've got to provide it. And I, I think there is certainly in Latin America, a different kind of uh, mentality, different kind of way of thinking about the value of schooling, the, the school day, in, there are fewer hours in the school day and how the day is used is for somewhat different purposes, right? I, I, I'm in no position to judge whether academic standards are higher or lower. It, it's just a very different kind of culture. And I would say likewise in Europe is that, you know, some of the, some of the Jewish day schools are very small they lack it, they lack resources. And what people come to those schools for is a, a, a sense of community, right? Uh, you know, visiting a school uh, just before the pandemic in Helsinki, hardly any Jews in Helsinki, a thousand Jews, but there are a hundred kids in the Jewish day school, right? And they're really strapped for resources, but there's an incredibly warm sense of community in that place. And I think that, I think that's in the foreground and the academics, there's a sense that the academics kind of take care of themselves. I'm not suggesting that everybody move to Helsinki or Buenos Aires, but like there, there, there's a, there's, there are competing values here in many ways. Prisma's going to be looking at the families that joined day schools this year, correct? Yes. I mean, that's what Alex. With, with Alex. <laughs> uh -huh. So I mean, Alex's comment makes me think about that, right? As new incoming families to day school, right? What do they value, even though they haven't been able really to be a part of community in person, right? But what will we learn from those new families about what they valued this past, over this past year in comparison to their prior experiences? 
and what can we learn from that about what really is the primary, um, I don't say value, because there are lots of different mm -hmm. values, but what's, what, what are the things to sell kind of about mm -hmm. Jewish education that mm -hmm. we might not be used to selling? Right. It's not we're very used to, I think, here in North America, selling a great education, get ready for college, all the things that compare us to other private schools in some way or the best public schools. But I wonder if when we speak to these new families, we might actually hear that some of the other pieces are just as or even more valuable. Yeah, I, I would say two things to that uh, there's the what turn their heads initially to find to to choose to send their student to a Jewish day school. In some cases, a lot of people are suspecting that it was because they happen to be open and offering a better product. Uh, uh, but we think there's probably something a little bit more below the surface, which is why we just launched this uh, research with, with Rossoff Consulting. Um, but the other piece of it is what has been their experience while they've been there. Uh, and anecdotally, we've heard you know, from the school leaders greeting parents in the parking lot, you know, as they're, as they're coming in and their students are getting out of the cars and knowing everybody's names and knowing what the snacks that they're having during different times of the course of the day, it's a personal touch and a relationship between the school being administrators and teachers and staff and everybody and the families that people have been blown away by. And it has been a real personal touch moment for a lot of schools. And they have known and gotten to know families who have come in and made them really feel welcome and part of that community. So I think there is something of the education that they were providing that might have that might have opened the door for them. But we're hoping and we're hoping to uh, uh, understand this a little bit more from the research that we're going to be doing of what's going to keep them in, in sending their kids to Jewish day schools, because we think that this is a this is a turning point moment for the field. Our hour is just about up, so I wanted to um, just give all of you a chance. I know we went through a lot, but in the next um, 30 seconds or less of just giving a last impression of what of what the learnings were or where we touch on a little bit of it, where we can go from here, or any any last comment you would you would like to say about about some of this data in our conversation today. Um, and we can start with you, Mark, if you. I know that's unfair, but let's start with you. <laughs> uh, I mean, listen, this has been such, we've learned so much at every single phase of this. And as we've gone through, through that sort of the, the history that I sort of put out there uh, as the phase of the pandemic, we've learned so much. And it has really been, uh, from our perspective at Prisma, our partnership with organizations like JEIC and the Mayberg Foundation and Rossoff Consulting and uh, everybody who has supported us really diving in to understand what's been going on that we've been deeply appreciative of. And we look to see how that's going to shift the field uh, moving forward. Thank you. And Rachel? Yeah, I'll just say from a funder perspective, I think the, the value of research and, and data that it provides to us in thinking about what initiatives right, should be supported moving forward is, uh, is certainly a very important piece of the puzzle, right? It, we can't, we, we each can't operate in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. And so the more we can learn together um, based on data, I think that that serves the community at large. So I'll just, I, I think it's important to say where, again, that we thank the Jim Joseph Foundation for supporting this piece of research that we were all able to learn from and that we particularly were able to use as a you know, as colleagues. Thank you. And Alex, I'll give you the last words. Yeah, no, I, I would say, look, that, that's actually a sense of gratitude that uh, when, when you do work that people find useful and that might make a difference to their practice. And I think the second thing is, it's actually a sense of curiosity. The focus has really been on the, the child's experience. There's, there's a lot to be learned about the teacher's experience here, very much caught in the middle between taking care of their own children in many cases and taking care of other people's children. I, and I'm, I'm sure there is a lot to learn about how they've managed and, and how, how many of them have been able to be successful. Great, thank you. So we leave here with a lot of answers and a lot more questions as well, which I think is, is always good. Um, so I wanna thank again, thank you, Mark and Rachel and Alex for, for your time and sharing in sharing all of this with us today. And thank you to all the participants who joined and we look forward to learning together again in the near future. Have a good day, everybody. Stay well.